On the 15th of February, 2023, Behaviour Works Australia had the pleasure of hearing from Susan Mickey and Robert West about the Human Behaviour Change Project, Behaviour Change Techniques and Ontologies. Enjoy. So I'm Director of the Centre for Behaviour Change and we're um, 10, a core, core of 10 people. Um, and we have two main missions. One is to bring together um, academic disciplines, um, primarily across UCL, but beyond too, on the basis that no one discipline has all the answers to behaviour change. And the other is, um, as you do, do so brilliantly, to translate academic expertise um, from the university out to all those who can um, benefit from it. And uh, we run uh, training, courses, um, both generic but also bespoke for various um, different organisations. We have an annual conference, uh, we run an MSc in behaviour change, and then we have uh, various hubs uh, for exchanging skills, ideas and resources. But we're a very small team. Um, the, on the right hand is a short course. We, we've um, produced just a, a five-week five um, course on, on behaviour change. Uh, so it's great that both sides of the world we're spreading the word about behaviour change. Okay, so the Human Behaviour Change Project is coming to an end. It's been, I think, uh, six years, probably pushing seven, what with COVID extensions. And it's a collaboration between behavioural scientists and primarily computer scientists. Okay, so on the left we have... Um, myself and Robert and other um, uh, behavioural scientists who've worked on it, uh, then computer scientists, and then uh, what we're calling systems architecture, led by James Thomas. And that's fine. Um, so the, the, the vision of the project, and actually, before I talk about the vision of the project, I'll say something about my experiences that led to this project. Um, we have an organisation in the UK called NICE, National Institute for hmm, Health and Care Excellence, thank you. Um, and it's charged with producing evidence-based guidelines uh, for um, public health and health services. And I sat on its Public Health Interventions Advisory Committee from beginning to end, it's eight years. And so what we would we would get um, questions from our government ministers, we'd translate them into something answerable, uh, we'd commission reviews, cost effectiveness and evidence reviews, uh, we'd get with, you know, expert um, input, people from lived experience, etc. Uh, field test it, take about two years, <laughs> best part of two years, by which time the ministers left, things have moved on. And I just thought this is not fit for purpose. You know, we need something quicker. And so automation was an obvious um, thing to, to do and using the you know, powers of computer science as it was developing. And the other was, uh, for many, many years, I worked as a consultant for our Department of Health. Um, and again, being asked to um, answer questions quickly um, using evidence and feeling that I was just scratching the surface, I, I just wasn't confident in that amount of time that I could really come up with um, recommendations and advice that I, I really, you know, I suppose I was confident in because of only a tiny slice of the evidence I ever looked at. So those were the, the things that thought, okay, how can we get together, harness what computer science can bring to do this at speed, at scale, um, looking at uh, you know, all of the evidence that's uh, relevant. Um, and I suppose another driver was a frustration in, in terms of the slow advance of behavioural science, you know, compared to, I thought, the potential and where it should be. And I felt part of that is because we're not scientific enough. We're not rigorous enough in our methods and our terminology, etc. So that was another driver. Um, so the vision of the project uh, was to develop an understanding of human behaviour to answer the variants of what we call the big question. And policymakers, planners, practitioners, all the people you interact with, I'm sure you'll recognise, they don't answer the whole of this question, but parts of it. So that when it comes to behaviour change interventions, what works compared with what, for what behaviours, how well, for how long, with whom, 
in what setting and why. Now, even if you just take a couple of those parts of the sentence, um, those of us who've done evidence reviews, what's the answer? The answer is small to medium effect with large heterogeneity. <laughs> what can we do with that? And, and it's understanding that heterogeneity that is absolutely key to thinking, okay, so how would this evidence apply in that setting? Um, but because we only have, you know, a few hundred papers or whatever, and um, our brains aren't big enough to detect patterns at scale, uh, we can't answer anything like even part of these questions with the traditional um, systematic review methods. Okay, just go through this. Um, uh, okay, so um, actually I jumped ahead of myself. This is what I was saying previously. Um, but just to elaborate, the evidence synthesis being not fit for purpose, too slow, partial evidence, um, and integrated poorly. You know, how do you put all these variably written papers together uh, in a way that, that makes sense? And um, again, interventions are poorly reported. And this was the driver for the taxonomy of behavior change techniques that myself and colleagues developed. Because when the Department of Health would ask me to uh, answer a question, and I tried to bring the evidence together. How do you put these things together when the interventions are written up so differently, um, so I, I literally went down and, you know, took all the um, lowest level bits that I could um, find and then think, okay, the, the same, same things thing. are being called different, uh, uh, different things and the same terms are being used for different things. And so that was why I came up with behavior change techniques. And the same with um, theories, when I did um, a, a review of theories, behavior change theories, the, the same kind of thing. Lots of overlap, uh, poorly specified, and just means we, you know, we, we, we don't make as much progress as we could, put it that way. Okay, so part of the solution, better reporting of all aspects and in interventions, their mechanisms of action and their context, because if we don't have that, we can't replicate findings when we do get effective interventions. Um, and also, it's really hard to, to improve interventions. Um, so, uh, the idea is to develop methods to organize and synthesize large amounts of complex evidence at scale and rapidly. And our evidence is very complex, um, as we all know. And the other issue um, that was a driver was that <laughs> when I was on, on the NICE committee, uh, we were making recommendations um, to, you know, help with disadvantaged communities and dis disadvantaged areas of the UK. Where was most of the evidence produced? The United States. A lot of it was undergraduate. Um, and if you, you know, think about the world, where's the greatest need in terms of health and sustainability and pretty well everything? It's a part of the world, global size, where there's least direct evidence. So how can we make inferences from what we know to what we don't know? So that was another um, driver of this work. Okay, so on the left-hand side, uh, we have what we're all very familiar with, uh, what I'm calling messy evidence. We could call it complex, but um, it is pretty messy the way we report it in this pretty anarchistic fashion. And it's growing faster than humans can keep up with. Um, as I've quoted for a long time, um, that more, there's more than 100 um, publications a week of evaluations of behavior change interventions. And I'm uh, one of the things, a day, thank you, thank you, Robert. It's good to have a voice behind me. <laughs> and um, one of the things I, um, I'm doing at the moment, I'm chair of the WHO's um, technical advisory group for behavioral insights and sciences for health. They call it quite a mouthful. Um, but they are um, trying to get a, a resolution on behavioral science through the United Nations. And um, they, want, <laughs> they wanted a reference for this. And I realized I didn't have any reference. So Robert very um, expertly did a quick um, review and, um, and, and showed the evidence that that was true. So that was lucky that it was a true fact. Um, and has, has published it in 
a publishing platform called Chaos. I don't know if you know this publishing platform, Q-E-I-O-S. We can talk about it later. Um, but it's, it's, it's a great um, publishing platform because you can publish things and it has uh, its own identifier. Um, and then you get post-publication review. So you can publish things really quickly. So we were able to publish that in time for them to, to use it in that report. But, but let's come back to it because I think it could be really helpful um, for you. So, and, oh, sorry. That's fine. Um, on the left-hand side, if you go back, yeah, um, is what we start with. On the right-hand side, we want to turn it into well-organized, useful scientific insights. So up to date, that was the other thing. You know, a lot of the literature we're using these are 10 years old often. Um, Up-to-date estimates of the effectiveness of behavior change interventions. As I said previously, unpacking the reasons for heterogeneity and in intervention effectiveness. You know, our theories of behavior change are mainly about processes of change. They're not about explaining heterogeneity. And I think this is a key area for development in behavioral science. Um, and then, ideally, uh, generating new testable hypotheses about behavior change. How do we do all this? The middle column here. Develop an ontology. Who here has heard of ontologies? A couple of you, okay. Well, I only heard about them a few years ago. Um, but they're basically a, an organizing structure for representing knowledge in the most general sense. Um, and it um, basically allows people to be talking about the same thing. So, you know, when one person says, I don't know, self-efficacy, we all understand what that means and use it in the same way. Um, and another advantage is that it enables um, uh, domains of knowledge uh, to be integrated. So across topic areas uh, like health or sustainability, but also uh, across disciplines you know, anthropology, sociology, psychology, they all have their different languages. When I did a, a multidisciplinary project on this, uh, looking at theories of behavior change, you know, quite early on, I realized we needed a consensus for what do we mean by theory and what do we mean by behavior? And it was a very useful um, exercise and it's in the publication um, that we uh, subsequently produced. But, you know, for, for um, behavior, I mean, anthropologists and sociologists often really hate that term. They sometimes think it's too prescriptive and limiting. And um, so anthropologists tend to use the word um, habitus and sociologists, social practices. And they all have different nuances. But if we are to build evidence together, we have to be able to link these sorts of things together. And then um, using, uh, by, by organizing, uh, the knowledge from published interventions of behavior, published evaluations of behavior change interventions, um, uh, we can do it in such a way that it becomes computer readable, you know, because every, there's an ID for every single term. And so then we can uh, hook into AI, natural language processing, um, machine learning, etc. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to use the same term. Anybody can use whatever terms they want. But the idea of an ontology is you define it in such a way that you can link it with other terms so you can see, you know, what is the actual meaning and how does it relate to others. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, as you know, we've got some really helpful uh, reporting guidelines and taxonomies to um, uh, improve the work we're doing. And it's made a massive difference. If you could just click through these. Um, I don't know if you know of uh, the Tidea framework, it's really helpful. Um, Tammy Hoffman, uh, who led it, Paul Blasey, both um, fellow Australians. And if you, uh, oh yes, and, and the Cochrane collaboration, again, the Australasian one is based in Monash, led by Sally Green, who's a long standing collaborator, and the um, taxonomy of behavior change techniques. So these are all you know, good steps forward. Tidea is, I think, really worth you looking at. It's quite a high level. Uh, way of um, organizing um, and, and categorizing uh, interventions. Okay, so uh, behavior change techniques, I think, are, are you all familiar with them here? Okay, so I can skim over this, uh, this slide. Oh yes, if you go back, that's actually a key part, that, that part there. Okay, um, all well and good, 
uh, but it's not linked to other aspects of intervention. So if you go back to the big question at the beginning, um, there's many things that we need to know about an intervention if we can really answer that question. Uh, so we need to know, for example, how is it delivered? There's so many different ways of delivering. Who's delivery? What mode of delivery? Uh, what schedule of delivery? Uh, what dose, et cetera? Um, then there's also the behavior itself. Um, you know, what is the actual nature of the behavior uh, that we're talking about here? You know, the techniques will be very different according to the delivery, according to the behavior. What are the mechanisms of action that link um, the intervention with the behavior? Um, and then there are um, things to do with engagement and reach. Again, you know, we need to understand these things if we're going to understand. What's the reason for the effectiveness, lack of effectiveness, degree of effectiveness of interventions? Um, and then there's the context, you know, the population and the setting, as we all know. You know, you can take a set of BCTs, it'll have very different uh, effects um, according to um, these aspects of context. So now the next slide. Um, and um, this is where I thought, OK, we need to go beyond um, behavior change techniques into uh, thinking about this as a much broader ontology. And at this point, I'll hand over to Robert. And also, both glasses of water are off. Brilliant. I'll, I will grab one. So we will swap places and I will shout from behind if okay. you get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so uh, Susan. Uh, introduce the concept of ontologies, and can I just have, have a refresh on how many people uh, have heard of ontologies? Everyone! Uh, how many people know what an ontology is? Okay, you have to. Uh, okay, so um, the, the, the sort of philosophical concept of ontology is just, um, is just, you know, the world and understanding the world. Ontologies are computer artifacts, basically. Uh, they are ways of representing the world in such a way that both humans and computers can understand what you're talking about and to make sure that you're always, when you refer to something, you're always referring to the same thing. And every time you go onto Google or every time you go on, you do some shopping on Amazon, Boo, or, uh, or uh, probably most of these large sites here, or if you use chat GPT, if you, have, if you haven't used it, give it a go, it's fun. Um, it's all got, they've all got ontologies behind them. And the reason for that is because it's a simple data structure, but it, it's a very powerful one. And the basic concept behind it is that you, you have what are known as entities. Entities are literally anything you can think of. They can be instances like me, I'm an entity. They can be classes of things like humans, I'm a human being. So instances are members of classes. Classes can be um, subclasses of other classes. So human beings are subclasses of hominids, or subclasses of animals, mammals, etc., etc. Once you've got that kind of basic um, structure and you've got your definitions of those entities very clearly defined, you can do so much more than you could possibly do with the sort of way that we normally talk in behavioral science about the stuff that we do. And where it really took off in science was in biology with the gene ontology. Um, and it was, it was really transformational for, uh, for basically uh, for uh, biology in terms of um, unifying the, the terminology and the theoretical underpinnings. And the key, um, the key sort of principle underpinning how you, you, you work with ontologies is you look at the relationship between the entities. Um, because that effectively, if you can think of those as like a semantic web, they, those relationships ultimately define the meaning of those entities for a computer. The computer doesn't care what you say about it. The com all the computer knows is what relationships you've defined between that entity and other entities, of which the most important is the subclass relationship. So, for example, um, in my field of smoking cessation, if I um, refer to um, nicotine chewing gum, for example, that's a subclass of nicotine replacement therapy, which is a subclass of pharmacotherapy for smoking cessation. Okay, that's great. That means that if I'm doing search 
on nicotine replacement therapy, I can look at the child classes, I can look at the parent classes, and if I'm doing in, uh, integration of the evidence relating to those things, I can go up and down those, um, those hierarchies to whatever level of detail is needed to remove the heterogeneity. So for example, if I say, it, it actually turns out to be the case that most nicotine replacement therapies are pretty similar in terms of their efficacy. But let's, but they're not entirely, they're not exactly similar. But let's say I was doing my uh, Cochrane review on NRT, on nicotine replacement therapy, and I'm getting heterogeneity. Damn it. You know, okay, what's going on here? It could be that I'm at too high a level of uh, abstraction. I need to go down. I say, okay, right. If I split it up into nicotine gum, nicotine lozenges, nicotine nasal spray and so on, now the heterogeneity goes away and I've got an understanding and we're starting to get an answer to Susan's question. Um, but then you can go beyond that, um, beyond your intervention content and so on, to the populations, to the settings, all of those things. So, for example, it, it turns out that behavior change techniques, this is a paper that just came out last year that um, Susan and I were involved in. Uh, it turns out that a specific, specific set of behavior change techniques um, has X effect if you deliver it face to face and much less of an effect if you deliver it using some other distance intervention like uh, text messaging or whatever. Same behavior change technique, different delivery. And so you can see how ontologies now begin to, forget the next slide, uh, to give you a way or into answering this question because you get precision and everyone knows what they're talking about. So let's um, move on. So the behavior change intervention ontology is what we've been developing for the uh, Human Behavior Change Project. And it's, it, this is like a, you know, trying to do the Oxford English Dictionary. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a never ending task. But we've defined probably, I don't know, thousand or two terms so far. Um, but that's just the beginning. And what we hope, and, it, uh, and Susan must come back to this to talk about that, what's known as the Haiku Project. Um, you know what Haiku is? <laughs> it's actually, we've even got a Haiku for the Haiku Project, actually, which I made up. Um, but um, I, I can't remember what it is. But anyway, um, the, the, uh, what we're looking to do is to extend the, human, the, the behavior change intervention ontology. And the only way we can ever do that is by bringing in interested parties to crowdsource the definitions and to contribute to it. So that's something maybe we could uh, talk about later. But essentially, the, um, the idea of the, human behavior, of the behavior change intervention ontology is I haven't turned this off now. Okay, um, uh, is to capture these bits of information. Um, and uh, if you look to the next thing, um, so that's this thing up here. It's an organizing structure, and we can move on. <clears throat> and this, you are, you are the very first to, uh, members of the public, in fact, the only person other than Susan who's seen this particular version of the diagram. Um, this is uh, the sort of behavior change mountain, if you like, which is snow-capped peaks at the top. Um, and uh, it's a way of representing the sort of high-level constructs that you need to, the bits of information you need to have to be able to understand what's going on. And at the top, you've got this thing, the outcome behavior value. The outcome behavior value is usually a number, like 24.3%, okay? And the rest of it, is what that number means, right? And how you got to that number. And the arrows in this part of it, the blue part of it, uh, um, represent causal links between the components of the uh, of the what's known as the behavior change intervention scenario. So the behavior change intervention scenario is the intervention, and everything else you need to know about the intervention that would enable you to understand what effect that intervention is having, right? But that's not enough because we don't have direct access to the to the world. You know, uh, we we can only get access to it by studying it, and the research methods themselves make a big difference to the value we end up with. That's twenty four point three. So, for example, in the field of smoking cessation, which in the Human Behavior Change Project is our main is our main use case because it's pretty well defined, uh, there's pretty good studies done on it. But if I say 24.3, for example, as the percent of 
people who stopped smoking, right, as a result of an, or having received an intervention, that means literally nothing. When did they stop smoking? How long is it? Is it was it a week ago? Was it six months ago? Was it two years ago? Okay, uh, who are these people? What's the setting? What was the intervention? So, in order to understand this this thing, this behaviour, uh, oh, and and when we're doing smoking cessation research, mostly uh, we use miss it, we use um, uh, missing equals smoking imputation, which means if we weren't able to get all the information we needed from you about your smoking status, we assumed you're smoking. Now that makes a huge difference, obviously, to what that percentage is. So to understand that percentage, you have you have to understand the scenario, but also the research methods that we used to uh, to create that number. Um, so that, this is basically the, the sort of the, the master plan in the Human Behaviour Change Project. Um, and it's also, as you could probably see looking at the terminology here, it's also uh, uh, the uh, sort of the blueprint for the answer to the big question. Because the big question, you know, what works, with whom, with, you know, for how long, etc., is all captured here. And we, if, uh, I'm just going to go through it very quickly and then we'll, we'll uh, sort of move on. But basically, uh, you've got the intervention and we divide the intervention into what's known as content and delivery. So content, if you think about uh, pharmacotherapy, for example, content would be nicotine. If you're giving nicotine replacement therapy or it'd be varenicline if you're giving Champix. The delivery would be the mode of delivery. Is it gum? Is it patch? Is it, you know, um, uh, is it a pill? You know, whatever. Um, but also, if it's a behavior change, if it's a sort of social or psychological style of behavior change intervention, was it face to face? Was it, you know, who did, was it given by a medic? Was it given by uh, a psychologist and so on? All of these things turn out potentially to matter. So content and delivery then also have underneath them, they branch out in this ontological way into lots of particular, uh, lots of subcategories. Okay. That then has an influence on what we call mechanisms of action. So, for example, again, using the, the smoking cessation thing, it could be craving. So how much craving there is. So the idea is you've got a drug like uh, varenicline, which reduces craving, which then has an influence on the outcome behavior, and the outcome behavior will be smoking cessation. However, um, contextual factors and engagement play a role in, in the likely outcome as well. And, by, and context here is a term that's used to, to uh, refer to the, both the population, well, the population, who is it that you're dealing with, is it people with mental health problems who will tend to have lower cessation rates, for example, um, although as it turns out, they respond despite what a lot of people think, and, but this is well known in Australia, I have to say, where you've got some really top people working on this. But they have this, the, the interventions to help people stop smoking work just as well in people with mental health problems as they do with people without. It's just that you're starting from a lower baseline. baseline. Anyway, so uh, the population is really important. The setting of the intervention is really important. It turns out that even things like country, what country you're in, make a difference. A uh, big study I was involved in with Champix and Zyban and NRT shows that actually that uh, the uh, cessation rates in America were lower than every other country uh, aggregated that we studied, which is probably because in that particular case, um, the uh, you know, with the tobacco control climate, a lot of the people who would have stopped smoking uh, um, would have already stopped smoking in the United States. So we're dealing with a harder population, sort of what they call hardcore. It's not really a good term, but anyway. So population setting and events. What else is going on at the time apart from your intervention? You know, is there some, is, is there COVID, for example, going on? Which, as it turns out, does make a big difference to uh, quit rates in certain countries. So you've got to have that. And then you've got your engagement. If they don't engage with the intervention, it isn't going to work. Um, and we divide that up into reach and exposure. And reach is just whether you got it at all. Did, were you, did, you, did, did it even sort of cross, come onto the horizon? And then you've got exposure, which will be how much of it you got and in what way you got it. So, and you can see that there are causal arrows here showing how these things interact with each other. And what that then 
tells you, because these are, these are conceptual errors, they must be true in some cases, and they may not be true in other cases. Um, what it tells you is if you're going to make a prediction as to what that value is going to be, you're going to have to use something more than some additive model, probably. In other words, it's a, a simple regression model is probably not going to cut it because these things are going to interact in quite complex ways. And that's why in the Human Behavior Change Project, when we, when we um, put all the information into the prediction system, we use a form of deep learning, a rule-based uh, machine learning system, which allows the data to speak to you in terms of what combinations of things add what and or take, subtract what from this particular outcome value. Um, and we add uh, various features. The, the part of the Human Behavior Change Project, which is not well elaborated at the moment, is the research study methods. There's still a lot of work to go on that. But we do obviously include things like what's the, um, whether it's got biochemical verification. We do have um, things like, you know, was it funded by the, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry? Uh, which makes a difference in many cases to whether what results you get, um, that kind of thing. But we've got a long way to go. And we, we're also building, and there's a risk of bias tool, which some of you have probably come across, uh, which um, there's an automated version of that, which we're also sort of plugging in. Yeah, so this is one condition in an RCT. All, this, all in the Human Behavior Change Project, we've only included RCTs, uh, <clears throat> but that's obviously, you know, that's something which would have to be extended later because RCTs obviously have their own uh, characteristics and limitations and so on. But this would be one arm of an RCT. So you replicate this for every arm of the RCT. And what we've done in the, in the Human Behavior Change Project is to code up manually uh, about 1,000 or 1,200 arms uh, from about 500 studies. And we've, um, uh, uh, we've working with I, well, IBM uh, research who um, were tasked to do this, uh, were tasked with the idea of, of the idea of basically automatically extracting this information from papers. Very, very difficult. In fact, incredibly difficult. They weren't unsuccessful. I think they felt they were very successful in computer science terms. It was, it, you know, computer science terms, breakthrough, fantastic. You know, in terms of what we needed, not good enough. So to give you an idea, there's a thing that in machine learning they call F1 score. Uh, the F1 score is a combination of sensitivity and specificity. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting, getting get off. <laughs> uh, anyway, but the but the uh, the F1 score goes between north and one, and for human coders, it uh, we were able to get an F1 score of around 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. Uh, this F1 score for the IBM's automated coding system was about point, between 0 0.4 and 0 0.5. Some of it, some of it was higher, some of it was lower, but it wasn't good enough. This is a big issue, which is something we, we'll come back to. But am I still going, or do? Okay, I thought I was only going to speak to this slide. Okay, okay. So this is these these are the sort of uh, component ontologies currently that make up the BCIO. Uh, we've got one which is sort of the upper level, which you, you just sort of seen um, uh, a, a schematic of. It's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but and then we've got one for the behavior change techniques coming soon to a uh, to a uh, something near you will be the behavior change technique ontology, which is going to be great. Uh, it's it's um, unfortunately there's a lot more um, entities in it than 93. I think it's maybe 200 and something. But but it does. But it's organized. It's, so, it's much, much better organized so you can find stuff and you can see how it relates to each other much better. Um, we've got one for mode of delivery, one for source, like, you know, is it a, is it a health professional, whatever, intervention setting. And we, we're pretty close to uh, getting finished. Uh, some of these other ones, like schedule of delivery, dose style, mechanisms of action, which is a huge one. That's basically everything you wanted to know about humans uh, and their environments. So uh, that's quite big. Um, the target behavior, which we're working on at the moment, and I'm, uh, in fact, going to be talking a bit about um, later this week at a workshop or a masterclass. Um, pretty tricky doing an ontology of behavior, I can tell you, in case you ever tried to do it. Uh, populations and reach and engagement. So a lot of work, but, you know, irrespective 
of how successful we are at the moment in using this ontology to extract information from, from papers, which is really tough. The ontology provides potentially a, a, a much better solid scientific foundation for how we refer to stuff when we're writing papers, when we're doing grant applications, and when we're doing our manual annotations of papers. And the more we can get people to use these, this sort of approach, as they have done in, in um, biology, for example, and in you know, Google and so on, so when you Google something, you actually get what you're looking for rather than something else, uh, largely. Um, then uh, you know we can really start to motor, uh, but it's it's got to be a collaborative effort, and and it's got to be collaborative not only in using ontologies but also in helping to develop them. Because the, you know every day will be a new potentially every time there's a new paper published there will be potentially a new construct, a new term which actually is really good and useful. If people can plug those in to the ontology, then other people can use that entity knowing exactly what it is. Right, one more thing. Uh, oh, and further, okay, so further information. Um, so you, you've got all, you'll, they'll have all, you'll have all these slides, so you can just refer to them at your leisure, but the website, um, uh, we've got um, GitHub for those of you more technically minded. This is all open source, all the code, everything is open source. So if you fancy, you know, finding a way through the out the machine learning algorithm that does the prediction, then it's all there for you. Um, we use Open Science Framework uh, to host a lot of the material and a um, lot of the publications, most of them are being published on this open, uh, open um, platform, which is welcome, open research. Oh, and the last slide. And this, this, uh, so this is just something which we're just starting up now, or we're just, um, it's just going online, which is a series of webinars on all these different things. Yeah, right, um, six, 12 or so, and um, they'll be, in fact, uh, yeah, it's starting about a month. I think there'll be 12 weekly webinars on all the different aspects of this project. So probably about a 20, 25 minute introduction and then the rest of it will be questions and answers and discussion. So you know, do sign off, sign up if you're interested. Um, and also just to add about ontologies is there's always a feature um, for giving feedback and they're, they're continually evolving and updating. And there's you know, various criteria of what is a good ontology and keeping them updated is, is one of those criteria.